first, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Right, everyone, my name is Cathy Smith. I'd like to give you a brief introduction about the library system. Every good student should learn how to use the library. If you have to do a research project, the library is the place to go to for information. Libraries contain books and periodicals, magazines and newspapers on many different subjects. To find the information you need, you must know how to use the library. All libraries are organised in much the same way. Every library houses a collection of books. Many libraries also have periodicals, films and records. All the books in a library can be classified under two main categories, fiction and non-fiction. Books of fiction contain stories that were made up by the author. Books of non-fiction contain factual material. When doing research, you use non-fiction books because you are looking for factual information. All the fictional books in a library are grouped in one section. They are arranged alphabetically by the last name of the author. Many libraries also label the spines of all books of fiction with the letters FIC or F. All libraries have a system for organising and classifying non-fiction books. The most widely used system is the Dewey Decimal System. It was designed by an American librarian named Melvin Dewey. It is called a decimal system because it divides all non-fiction books into ten major categories. These are further divided into subdivisions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. For example, all science books are numbered from 500 through 599. Each different field of science has a number within the 500 category. For example, astronomy is 520 and chemistry is 540. The Dewey Decimal System provides a category for every type of non-fiction book. The best way to locate a book in the library is to use the card catalogue. The card catalogue is an index of all the books in the library. Information about a book is listed on cards. All the cards are filed alphabetically and stored in drawers in large cabinets. The card catalogue can help you locate a particular book, a book on a certain subject or a book by a particular author. In the card catalogue, each book has three cards, an author card, a title card and a subject card. The author card is alphabetised under the author's name. The title card is filed alphabetically according to the title of the book. The subject card is filed alphabetically under the name of the subject of the book. In many university libraries, they use their own Biblitus cataloguing system or the microfiche system. Both of them list publications under author and title, and both are very easy to use. Now, let us see the reference books. We all know that reference books make up important part of a library's non-fiction books collection. They contain facts and information about any subject you can think of. Reference books are not meant to be read from cover to cover. You should use them when you want important facts and information about a particular subject. Let's see some major types of reference books. First, dictionaries. Dictionaries are books that list and give the meanings of the words in a language. They also give the pronunciation of words in a dictionary which are listed alphabetically. Second is encyclopedias. 
Encyclopedias are reference books that provide factual information about people, events, places, and subjects of lasting interest. Each article is written by a specialist on the topic being discussed. An encyclopedia usually consists of a number of books arranged in a set. The volumes are arranged in alphabetical order according to the topic of each article. Letters are stamped on the spine of each volume to indicate the alphabetical rang of the topics in each volume. For instance, if you wanted to find information about the moon, you would look in volume eight of the encyclopedia pictured here. Next is atlases. An atlas is a book of maps. It may contain many different kinds of maps. The maps in an atlas are often arranged alphabetically by country or continent. Almanacs are also a type of reference books. An almanac is a book that contains recent statistics and summaries of information on a wide variety of topics. It is published annually. Information is listed alphabetically by subject. Indexes are alphabetical lists of names, titles, and subjects that tell where information about each can be found in other publications. For example, the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature can help you find magazine articles that have been published about a particular subject. It will give you the names of publications that have carried articles about the subject, the dates and volume numbers of the particular issue in which the articles appeared. You should be aware that reference books may not be taken out of the library under any circumstances. They are used only in the library. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Entrance to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to-do list for yourself and your supervisor, including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. 
show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work, including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point two, be efficient. Only read what you need to. Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. It's of critical importance to take good notes on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. 
You will hear a conversation between Caesar and a welfare officer. As you listen, answer questions eleven to twenty. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty one to twenty six. Good afternoon. My name's Caesar Bautisto. Hello, I'm Wendy, one of the welfare officers. Can I help you? Yes, I have to move out of my accommodation in two weeks, and I can't find anywhere else to live. Okay, I'll need to know some details about your current situation. I'm an overseas student. From the Philippines, the college gave me a temporary room for one month. I can't find anywhere else, and I have no money. Have you told the college about your position, or asked them to let you stay longer in your accommodation? No, not yet. I, I didn't think that would be possible. Well, we can contact the accommodation service on your behalf to see if they'll let you stay a little longer, until you can find an alternative. Thank you. But I'm not sure that I can find another place, as they all ask for money before moving in, and I don't have any. Yes, it is usual in this country for landlords to ask for up to a month's rent in advance. Don't you have any money at all? Hardly any. I'm waiting for my grant check to be sent from the Philippines at the moment. It should have been here for me to collect when I arrived in Britain, but it seems to have been lost. You can apply for emergency loan from the union if you want. The loan can be for up to two hundred pounds, and we ask for a postdated check for the same amount to be given to us, so that we can recover the money once you receive your grant check. That would be very good. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. I'll apply, but I'm still worried about how to find new accommodation. As I said earlier, we can ask the college to extend the time you're allowed to stay in your present accommodation. They may refuse, of course. Then what will happen? If the worst comes to the worst, the union may be able to provide some very short-term emergency accommodation. If you want me to. I'll contact one or two of the addresses on the notice board, and arrange for you to visit them. But what if they ask me for the rent in advance? I only have ninety pounds left, and I need that for food and books. It'll be all right. By the time they actually need the money, we'll have your emergency loan ready. Just fill in this application form, and write me a check for two hundred pounds, please, payable to the student union. Right, I'll do that. Thank you very much for your help. I'm feeling more optimistic now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. 
You are going to hear a conversation between two students about studying abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hey Mary, how's school going? Haven't seen you in a while. What have you been up to? John, good to see you again. I've been really busy the last couple of weeks. I'm applying to study abroad next year. Really? So am I. I think it will be a great experience to be able to study in another country. What country do you want to go to? At first I wanted to study in Africa, but my parents really don't want me to go there because they think it will be dangerous. So now I'm thinking about going to Spain, Italy or Japan. Actually, I think Africa would be a fascinating place. I would want to go there to visit. Maybe not to study, but definitely I would want to go visit. For next year, I want to go to either China or Germany to study, but my parents can't afford any European countries, so maybe... Why China or Germany? Well, I want to go to China because I think it's a really interesting country with a long history. Plus, it has been changing so much, and I think it is a great time to be there. I really want to improve my Chinese also, and I've been taking Mandarin courses the last two semesters. I would want to go to Germany because my mother is German, and I want to learn more about my cultural background. How about you? Why the countries you chose? Well, I want to go to a Spanish-speaking country. I took Spanish in high school, so I figure if I go to a Spanish-speaking country, I'll be better off knowing some of the language already. But I have already been to Mexico many times, and South American countries don't have classes for my major, except for Brazil, but they mostly speak Portuguese there. I would want to go to Italy because I want to do a study about ancient Roman civilization. It has always been a dream of mine to go and see Pompeii and the volcanic ruins. Plus, my family has Italian roots and I love Italian food. I want to go to Japan mainly because my girlfriend was born in Japan and always tells me all of these fascinating stories about Japanese history and culture. I am a big fan of sumo wrestling also. So I've always wanted to see a sumo match in person. I really love sushi and almost all Japanese food. Recently, I have started to watch some Japanese baseball too. But of course, these are all secondary reasons. My main reason is of course my girlfriend and understanding her culture. I don't speak any Japanese though, so that is my major drawback. I think it is much better to go to a country if you can speak the language. That's great. When do you have to decide by? I have to finish all my applications this week. I'm really stressed trying to finish everything, on top of all my schoolwork. I'm almost done with my applications. I just have to finish the Italy application. I think my last choice is Italy, so I'm doing that one last. How long do you want to go for? I think I'm only going to go abroad for one semester, or else I won't be able to graduate on time. I have many classes left until I can finish my degree, and I'm not sure if I will be able to take them studying out of the country. I think I might be able to study in Spain because my Spanish is fluent, but definitely not in Italy or Japan, unless they have classes offered in English. I want to go for a year. I've heard that it's better to go for a year because you get a full experience and get a better grasp on the language. But I understand that most people can't finish their degree in time. It was hard trying to decide which country I would rather go to, but I think my first choice is to go to China. I know Germany will be great also, Either way, I will be thrilled to have the opportunity to study there. What's your first choice? I really don't have one. Actually, I think I'm like you. 
Just being able to study in another country will be great. Either Japan or Spain will be awesome. Italy will be awesome too. But I've been there a bunch of times, so I think I prefer to go somewhere else. Sounds exciting. We'll have to go to class now. It was great talking to you again. See you around next time? Yeah, sure. See you around. Hope that everything goes well. That is the end of part four.